is going to work perfectly <laughs> from the off <laughs> and nothing will go wrong. And then we'll know we're in heaven. <laughs> okay, let's be still. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning as your family. We ask you to make your presence felt here in church and with all who are at home. Help us to know that you are with us. By your spirit, guide us, inspire us, encourage us. Draw us deeper into worship and deeper into the embrace of your love. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We say together, Almighty, Almighty God, God, to whom to all hearts are open, all, all desires known, and, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts, thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration, by the inspiration of, your of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily, worthily magnify, magnify your holy name, name. through Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's say together, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord of heaven and earth, as Jesus taught his disciples to be persistent in prayer, give us patience and courage never to lose hope, but always to bring our prayers before you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 to 9, 15, 31 to 33. Absalom's death, David mourns. The king commanded Joab, Abishai and Ittai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of his commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men than that day than a sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair, while the mule he, had, he was rising kept on going. And ten of Joab's armour bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, but Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him in a big pit in the forest, and piled up a heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. 
During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the king's valley as a monument to himself. For he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's monument to this day. Now I, Maz, son of Zadok, said, let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hands of the enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news at another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, said again, come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, my son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. He said, come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, run. Then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and outrun the Cushite. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner and he called down to the gatekeeper, look, another man running alone. The king said, he must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimaaz, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my Lord, the king. The king answered, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all those who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we read Psalm 130 today. Out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than the night watch for the morning. More than the night watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. With him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. The New Testament reading is from Ephesians, 
chapter 4, verse 25, to chapter 5, verse 2. Living as children of light. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a, fra a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Oh God, we long to hear you speaking. So speak to us now. Help us to listen, to hear and receive your word. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Do you get a sense of deja vu? Hear that reading and think, didn't we hear that last week? Well, you heard the first verse last week at the end of last week's reading. And in case you hadn't looked in your Gospel of John and chapter 6, I can tell you now that we get more bread next week as well. This whole chapter is about bread. You know, it kind of starts with the feeding of the 5,000. Five loaves. As I read and reread this chapter before last Sunday and again before today, 
One of the things which struck me is something which I had never realized until the first time I visited Israel. We're familiar with the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the town of David. What we often fail to recognize is that the name of that town, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, means literally house of bread. I wonder whether the number of times that Jesus focuses on bread in his teaching has something to do with his recognition of the significance of the place of his birth. The house of bread, Bethlehem, is where Jesus was born. Throughout John's gospel, we're often told by others, isn't this Jesus from Nazareth? And yes, Nazareth was his hometown, but he was born in the house of bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And the Jews there began to grumble against him. There is a very subtle but significant shift in that verse, verse 41. Up to that point, Jesus has been speaking to the crowd. But now, at this point, this conversation is between him and those who John identifies as the Jews. And scholars are divided as to who he means when he refers to the Jews. Is it the Judeans? Is it those people from Jerusalem and the area around, the southerners, who think that they are better than these northern Galileans? Or is it the Jewish religious leaders who were all southerners from Jerusalem? In other words, is it a very narrow group or a slightly wider group? It is a distinct group within the crowd that are there listening to Jesus, who are grumbling about him. Because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. No, he didn't. He said, I'm the bread of life. They're actually conflating what Jesus says about himself with the tradition about the manna given to the Israelites in the wilderness. They see what Jesus is referring to as being about that sustenance given by God to his people at their time of need. And that's as much as they see. But even that is too much for them to comprehend. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Uh, no. Whose mother and father we know. How can he then say, I came down from heaven? What they think they know about Jesus blinds them to what Jesus is revealing about himself. And how often do we fall into the same trap? What we think we know prevents us from learning something new. What we think we know about those people, that group over there, what we think we know about that situation means that we can't possibly conceive it might actually be different to our understanding. That's where these Jews find themselves. They think they know who Jesus is, and so they cannot possibly conceive that he could be anything other than their knowledge of him. And Jesus' answer, Jesus' response to them is actually quite rude. It's translated in the NIV as stop grumbling among yourselves. Actually, effectively, what he says 
is shut up and listen. You need to hear what I'm saying. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. Think about that for a moment. We talk about choosing to follow Jesus. And yes, we have to make that choice. But before we are able to make that choice, it is the Father who draws us to him. And again, the, the wording used is significant because that word draws in the Greek is the same word that was used for hauling the nets back on to a fishing vessel. It's dragging. The Father drags us to him. I don't know what your experience was personally, individually, of coming to faith. But I do know what mine was. And mine began with resistance. Mine began with me saying, that's all very well for you, but I'm not at all convinced. I don't know that I believe that. And then the pennies started to drop. And things started to add up. Until finally, that point where I had to say, okay, God, if you're really there, and you're really who these people say you are, then I give in. Come into to my life. Be God for me. Jesus, be my saviour. I didn't realise it at the time, but when I look back at that, I can see where God was dragging me to that point. And exactly the same process happened over the whole business of, of realising that God was dragging me into this ministry. When I first got an inkling that God might be asking me to become an ordained minister in the Church of England, I wanted to run as far as possible in the opposite direction. I tried to do deals with God. Leave me alone. Let me be successful in my, it wasn't really my chosen career, but the career I'd fallen into as a sales rep. You know, let me sell lots of stuff, whatever it is, whichever company I'm working for, let me make lots of money, I'll put lots of it in the collection for you. Uh, I'll even serve on the PCC, you know, but don't make me turn my collar back to front. And eventually, God wore me down because he kept on dragging. There is that um, poem which was my mother's favourite, particularly towards the end of her life, the Footprints poem. And that dream of walking along a beach with Jesus, with scenes of the, of the person's life flashing across the sky. When they look back along the beach, they see that every so often there's only one set of footprints. And that one set of footprints corresponds to those difficult times in life. And the person having the dream says to Jesus, I don't understand, you said you would never leave me. How is it that in those most difficult times in my life, there's only one set of footprints? And Jesus' answer is, that was when I was carrying you. Or Sarah will tell you, our daughter, that there were times when it didn't feel like she was being carried. And that rather than one set of footprints in the sand, it would have been a groove where she was being dragged. Sometimes that's our experience. Sometimes God drags us, not just to him, but through those difficult times. And usually, I would venture to say, for most of us, if we're being dragged, it's because we're resisting. We're trying to do it in our own strength, in our own way. 
Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, drags them, pulls them in. Then I will raise them up at the last day. And this wonderful verse from the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Isn't that what we long to be? Taught by God? I said in that prayer before I began speaking, Lord, help us to listen, to hear, to receive your words. That should be our prayer daily. Help us to listen, to hear, to see what you are doing. Teach us what it is that we need to know. Because Jesus says, everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. There is a, a direction of movement in this passage, and it's all towards Jesus. Because that ultimately is where we should all be headed. No one has seen the Father except the one who's from God. Only he has seen the Father. Only Jesus has actually seen the Father. And yet, Jesus makes the Father known to us. There is a connection here between seeing and believing. It's a connection which comes out again through this gospel, culminating particularly in that upper room after Jesus' death and resurrection and Jesus' words to Thomas. You have seen and you believe. How blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And this word believe has the connotation of trust. It's not just um, a, a, a acknowledgement of existence. It's not just assent to the notion of who Jesus is. If we truly believe in him, we trust him implicitly. If Jesus says jump, we will jump because we trust he knows why we must. Where Jesus says, go, we will go, because we trust in him. He knows where and when and why we should go. The one who believes has eternal life, says Jesus. I am the bread of life. The bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Why? Because Jesus is the living bread, the life-giving bread. The manna which was given to the Israelites in the wilderness was temporary. It spoiled, it rotted. They couldn't keep it. They had to trust that God would provide daily. And they also had to trust that when God says, on this day, gather twice as much, because tomorrow the Sabbath there won't be any, that he meant it. Go back and read those verses in the Old Testament, and you'll see what happens when the Israelites fail to trust, to believe what God is saying through Moses. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus' original audience could not have understood all that he was saying. They didn't have a frame of reference that would allow them to at that point in time. We look back with the benefit of hindsight. We know that when Jesus says, this bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world, he is referring to his death on the cross. They didn't know that then. 
I wonder whether any of them, of these Jews who were grumbling and complaining at Jesus, whether any of them ever did look back and say, ah, now I get it. Now I know what he was saying. Or did they remain blinded in their assumption that they knew who he was? And if Jesus is the bread of life, the life-giving bread who sustains all who believe in him, what else does this say to us today? Firstly, yes. You know, we are being drawn by the Father, dragged by him to Jesus. We need to take him at his word. We need to accept that he is who he says he is and to be sustained by him. And this communion service is a deliberate reminder of who Jesus is and what it means to be sustained by him who is the bread of life. But I think it perhaps means even more than that. Because Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. Jesus calls his disciples to do what he has been doing. In fact, he says to those immediate disciples, to the apostles, I give you the power and the authority to do what I've been doing. You will do as much and more. So if Jesus is the bread of life, sustaining all who believe in him, Perhaps we are called also to be bread for those who are hungry. To be life-giving to those who are struggling. Think of the people who have nourished you in your life so far. I don't mean those who put a plate of food in front of you. Those who by their actions, by their words, by their treatment of you, have helped you to flourish, have helped you to become the person that you are. And consider that perhaps Jesus is calling us also to do the same for others. To look for those situations when we can provide support and encouragement, nourishment to those who are in need of nourishment. It may be just a simple encouraging word or an arm around a shoulder, a shoulder to cry. It may be just saying, well done, or keep going. Or it may be meeting a greater need than that. But I don't think we can ever read these words recognize who Jesus is without also recognizing that we are called to follow him. And that means we are called also to nourish others. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you draw us to Jesus and through him to yourself. We thank you that in Jesus, you nourish us, you equip us, you strengthen us. Lord, we pray that we may truly believe in you, trust you, and walk with you. That in us, you might encourage others through us, you might draw others to yourself. And Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let us profess the faith of the church. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thanks, Jane. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Father, we give you thanks that you have called us to know you and to love you. You have drawn us to yourselves with yourself with bonds of love. Help us to listen and to obey your word. Lord Jesus, true bread from heaven, giving life and refreshment to the world, fill our lives with your goodness and your church with your presence, that we may live and work to your praise and glory. Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, giver of all good gifts, we thank you for all that satisfies and sustains us. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We give thanks for all who work hard to preserve the world that we live in. Guide all who influence the well-being of the earth, for those who work in conservation and for ecologists and scientists who are working hard to find solutions to global warming and climate change. We pray for those in Turkey and Greece whose homes and livelihoods have been devastated by the fires that are sweeping across their countries for those who have lost loved ones and for those who are still missing. We pray for the firefighters who are having to risk their lives in tackling the fires, a result of climate change, but in which we all have a responsibility. Help us to be more mindful and respectful of the world that we live in a world created and loved by you and that we are merely, merely caretakers of for future generations. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who have amassed wealth but are poor in spirit. 
for all who are suffering because the wealth in the world is unfairly distributed. And so as some prosper, others perish. Lord of all that is beautiful, we pray for areas defaced or destroyed, places where people's only choice is to live in slums and appalling conditions. We remember all whose lands have been ravaged by war, where there's strife and division, intolerance and trust. Help us to play our part in resolving the injustice that exists in your world and to strive towards a fairer world for all. Help us to remember how fortunate we are to live in a place of safety and of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. For those who are lonely or fearful. Those who are in despair. Those who are too afraid to trust themselves or others. We pray for those who are the victims of violence, remembering in particular the young girl who was stabbed in Orpington on Friday, early hours of Saturday morning and her family. We remember before you, Lord, those known to us who are facing sickness or suffering. And we ask your blessing upon anyone who is known to us. Give them hope in their troubles and comfort and healing in their sickness. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We give thanks for all who have passed beyond death and been transformed in your glorious kingdom. We pray for those they leave behind and who miss their physical presence. We pray especially today for Natalie and Chris as they come to terms with their recent loss. We pray especially for anyone we know who is in need of your comforting presence at their time of loss or anniversary. May they, and we in our turn, live forever in the joy of your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We rejoice that you sustain us with the bread of life. Through our union with Christ, you offer us life eternal. Help us who are sustained and nourished by your actions of love. Take that gift out into the world and share with all those we encounter. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Where you are, let's offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you.
The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and one for you, a holy people. 
Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we share together this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
God of our pilgrimage, you have willed that the gate of mercy should stand open for those who trust in you. Look upon us with your favour, that we who follow the path of your will may never wander from the way of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit loves give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And there you see the notices for the week ahead. Tomorrow is the Mother's Union pilgrimage to the cathedral. If you want to know more about that, speak to Mary Margaret, um, and she can fill you in on all the details. And the, the Monday evening Bible study group meets via Zoom. I'll send the link out for that later today um, so that you've got that ready for tomorrow evening. Our usual coffee and chat on Thursday morning in the North Room. Do come and join us if you're free at that time. It's always good to, to welcome people um, into that space and that opportunity to actually share together in fellowship. Um, and then of course next Sunday back here in church or on Zoom or and on Zoom I should say at 10 o'clock. Thanks, Nick.
So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with us and with all whom we love, now and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Roger.